from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Good afternoon and welcome to the Library of Congress. I appreciate all of you coming for this noontime lecture recital. Uh, today I'm going to be discussing the audacity of Hope Kirk. Uh, the title of my lecture is obviously meant to be a play on President Obama's book, The Audacity of Hope. However, it may be slightly misleading. Uh, Helen Hope Kirk, who was born in Scotland in 1856 and died in Boston, in 1945, after immigrating to the United States, was in fact a kind and gracious person. She was also, however, an extremely talented woman who pursued an uncompromising career as a virtuoso pianist, respected piano teacher, and composer without accepting the societal constraints that were regularly put on her gender. From a 21st century perspective, it is hard to imagine a woman in the late 19th century and early 20th century that was so fiercely talented and independent while still maintaining an unusually happy marriage and a successful career as a musician, and yet was not particularly concerned with the larger issue of women's rights. But Helen Hope Kirk was a musician first. Everything else was secondary. That was the audacity of Hope Kirk. Unlike many women who struggle to have their compositional voices heard over the years, Helen Hopkirk lived something of a charmed life. She was born in Edinburgh, Scotland to a family of musicians. Her father owned a music store. And from an early age, her parents afforded her every opportunity to develop her considerable talent. She began to study the piano seriously at the age of nine and gave her her first public performance at age 11. In 1876, at the age of 20, she entered the Leipzig Conservatory, where she studied composition with Karl Reinecke and Solomon Jadeson, and piano with Louis Moss, a prominent German-born pianist and composer who, like Hopkirk, would eventually immigrate to Boston and join the faculty of the New England Conservatory of Music. Hopkirk fondly remembered her studies in Leipzig, saying, quote, one breathed in music with the air, one met other students freely and discussed freely, and a young musician who has not had such an experience has lost something. When I left Leipzig, I thought all happiness had gone forever." End quote. Two of her fellow students who would become important colleagues in the future were Karl Mook, who would go on to be an important conductor with whom Hope Kirk performed as a soloist many times, and the American composer George Chadwick, who would facilitate her eventual move to Boston. After her studies in Leipzig, Hope Kirk concertized with great success around Great Britain. Her first major concert was a performance of Saint-Saëns' second piano concerto, which according to a London newspaper, excited a storm of genuine applause and two recalls. Just as a side note, since it's election day, in this context, recall means coming back out and bowing again, not recounting votes. Um, during this period, she met Clara Schumann, who, according to Hopkirk's diary, quote, invited me to sit beside her when she practiced at Broadwoods, and also heard me play different Schumann works, telling me very interesting things about them, end quote. Of course, in her diary, she doesn't tell us what these interesting things are, but apparently Clara gave her some insight into the music. Uh, at that time, she also met Edvard Grieg, whose piano works she would champion in recital, and Anton Rubinstein, of whom she said, no player has ever had the same power over me or seemed to me so giant-like. In 1882, she married William A. Wilson, a Scottish music critic and businessman. Wilson appreciated his wife's extraordinary talent and unusually for the time took care of all of their household business to give Helen the freedom to compose, practice, and concertize. The next year, Hope Kirk made her American concert debut with the Boston Symphony. The Boston Herald said, her playing shows her to be a true musician as well as an excellent pianist, and her intelligence was amply shown in all her work. A concert tour of America brought further accolades for her musicianship and the scope of her repertoire, which one paper said was probably larger than any other pianist save Rubinstein. 
Anton. Uh, in 1886, she returned to Edinburgh after seven years of actively concertizing in the United States and Europe. Always eager to improve, Hope Kirk decided that she should study with Franz Liszt, who she had met briefly during her student days in Leipzig. Unfortunately, when she set out to the Bayreuth Festival to meet Liszt, she was greeted at the railway station by a newspaper headline reporting his death. Bummer. Unthwarted, she gave a number of concerts in Leipzig and then moved to Vienna to study with Theodor Leschetizky, who had studied with Carl Czerny and was one of the foremost piano pedagogues in Europe. She also studied composition at this time with Karl Navratil. During her two years in Vienna, she concentrated entirely on her studies and did not perform in public. In 1889, she returned to the stage giving recitals in Scotland, Vienna, and Leipzig before returning to the United States the following year where she appeared 43 times as an orchestral soloist, chamber music performer, and solo recitalist across the country. Hope Kirk began to include her own compositions in her programs, including uh, nearly half of the solo recitals that she gave that season. She and her husband then moved to Paris in 1892, where she was able to devote herself entirely to composition and teaching over the next three years. The couple soon returned to London, where Helen gave a number of recitals, and during the winter of 1896, William Wilson, her husband, was struck by a cab in Leicester Square and seriously injured. His recovery was slow and his ability to work was limited. But Hope Kirk's experience in Paris, living the comparatively calm life of a composer and teacher, combined with the gravity of the couple's financial situation, caused her to come to the decision to scale back her career as a virtuoso in favor of a more reliable income. Soon after her decision was made, she serendipitously received a message from her Leipzig classmate George Chadwick, who was the head at the time of the New England Conservatory of Music in Boston, offering her a teaching contract to teach piano beginning in the autumn of 1897. They made their home in or near Boston for the rest of their lives, save one year in Edinburgh, and became citizens of the United States. In addition to teaching and composing, Hope Kirk maintained a busy concert schedule limited primarily to the New England and New York area. Ever the indomitable spirit, she continued to add new repertoire to her solo recitals, championing the music of Edward McDowell and introducing American audiences to modern French works by Debussy, Faure, and Dandy. Of McDowell's Celtic Sonata, she said, one feels wrapped in the, in the elemental atmosphere of the old heroic times, with all the largeness and pathos and tragedy of ancient loves and wars. She also continued to compose with greater frequency, and in December of 1900 premiered her own piano concerto in D major, subtitled In the Mountains, with the Boston Symphony, and in 1904 gave the American premiere of her Concertstück for piano and orchestra. It was only a few months before Hope Kirk's first concerto was performed that Amy Beach had premiered her piano concerto with the Boston Symphony Orchestra. At that time, large-scale orchestral works were seen as the exclusive domain of male composers. Hope Kirk's two piano and orchestra pieces, as well as two orchestral tone poems, premiered in 1899 and 1910, were her only orchestral compositions that received a performance during her lifetime. The much more prolific and celebrated composer Amy Beach composed only five orchestral compositions total, including one symphony and one piano concerto, even though unlike Hope Kirk, she had concentrated exclusively on composition for most of her career after giving up concertizing at the behest of her husband in 1885. Despite their pioneering large-scale compositions, the vast majority of music written by women at the beginning of the 20th century was either instrumental works for piano or songs for voice and piano and both Beach and Hopekirk excelled in those genres. Hopekirk wrote many solo piano works for her own performance and others strictly for publication. Her instrumental sonatas were written primarily for friends and colleagues who she accompanied in recital, and most were never published. Neither were her orchestral works. Her songs, of which there are over a hundred, were not performed by Hopekirk in recital and were written for the most part specifically for publication. 
Publishers knew that women were one of the largest audiences for sheet music sales and clamored for new works to fill that need, especially from female composers. Hope Kirk's Scottish heritage is often in the foreground in her compositions. Many of the composers who Hope Kirk admired, including Liszt, Chopin, Grieg, and others, had made use of folk song melodies, dance rhythms, and poetry by their countrymen to express their own identity and draw attention, however obliquely, to the concerns of their homeland. Hope Kirk's most enduring works for voice and piano are in this vein, including settings of Robert Burns, Fiona MacLeod, and a set of 70 Scottish folk songs for which she wrote new piano accompaniments. Her folk song settings, published by Oliver Ditson in 1910, are the only works by Hope Kirk that have remained widely available, now in a reprint edition by Dover Publications. In her introduction to the volume, her political concerns are indelibly linked to her artistic ones. Another influence was the anglicizing of everything Scottish since the Union, girdling the world with Brixton, as George Moore expresses it. England brings material prosperity when she sets her foot on a lesser nation but it is generally accompanied by a waning interest in real things, which are the inward things. Utilitarianism versus beauty and spiritual falling off concealed by large religious machinery. Nowadays, when formerly the family would sing their own old songs, the vulgar strains of English music hall ditties are heard with a wretched accompaniment drummed out on a wretched instrument. I have not read an introduction like that to any volume of songs I have ever bought personally, but it goes on like that. And she continues to say that the ubiquitous presence of cheap, cheaply made pianos in the homes of Scottish families has caused a decline in appreciation for their folk music, a concern that she emphasizes with a quote from the great Irish poet William Butler Yeats, who said, folk art is indeed the oldest of the aristocracies of thought and because it refuses what is passing and trivial, it is the soil where all great art is rooted. Both Yeats and Hope Kirk, an avid reader and admirer of all aspects of the literary world, were among the many artists who had been influenced by the Celtic literary revival of the 19th century. The revival began with the appearance of a book of poems by Ossian in 1760 a book that the alleged editor, James McPherson, had claimed was collected from ancient Scots Gaelic sources, but was in fact more or less an original work. Despite the ensuing scandal, McPherson's work ignited the romantic imagination and led to a string of works exploring Celtic literature, such as Ernest Renan's The Poetry of the Celtic Race in 1856 and Matthew Arnold's On the Study of Celtic Literature in 1866. These, in turn, inspired Tennyson, Hardy, and many others to explore the characters and themes of Celtic literature and mythology in their own work. Among these was the poetic anthology Lyra Celtica in 1896, edited by Scottish poet William Sharp. It contained representative examples of both ancient and modern Celtic poetry. In the section of ancient poems, Sharp includes Ossian, saying that, quote, no single work in our literature has had so wide-reaching, so potent, and so enduring an influence, but also noting that the consensus of qualified opinion had decided that the poems were not authentic. Sharp's love of Ossian's poems is especially revealing when one discovers that in the section of modern and contemporary Scots Celtic poetry, the largest number of poems by any one author is allotted to Fiona MacLeod, the author of the verses set to music by Helen Hopekirk that we will hear this afternoon. Revealing because, unbeknownst to the literary world at large, Fiona MacLeod was actually a pseudonym used by none other than William Sharp himself. He had created the persona of Fiona MacLeod in 1894 for the publication of his, of his novel, Ferre, A Romance of the Isles, as a literary voice to express stories and poems that related to the natural and mystic world of Celtic mythology. 
He was, in essence, using an independent voice for the feminine side of himself that longed to commune with nature. Instead of inventing a literary character to act as his proxy in this pursuit, like Tennyson's Lady of Shalott, he created an entire persona. It was an identity that he would keep secret from almost everyone, including Helen Hopkirk, until his death. He confided in only his closest friends. His sister transcribed correspondence from Fiona to her many admirers, making the handwriting convincingly feminine. Sharp also took great pains in his correspondence to make sure that he and Fiona had not traveled to the same places or met the same people. In the foreword to the works of Fiona MacLeod, published posthumously in 1810, or in 1910, excuse me, Sharp's wife Elizabeth explains, though the Fiona MacLeod phase belongs to the last 12 years of William Sharp's life, the formative influences which prepared the way for it went back to childhood. Though the pains and penalties of impecuniosity during his early struggles in London tended temporarily to silence the intuitive, subjective side of his nature in the necessary development of the more objective, intellectual William Sharp, critic, biographer, essay, and novel writer, as well as poet, he never lost sight of his desire to give expression to his other self. When asked by a friend why he chose to write as Fiona MacLeod, William Sharp responded, I can write out of my heart in a way I could not do as William Sharp, and indeed that I could not do if I were the woman whom Fiona MacLeod is supposed to be, unless veiled in scrupulous anonymity. This rapt sense of one with nature, this comic ecstasy and elation, this wayfaring along the extreme verges of the common world, all this is so wrought up with the romance of life that I could not bring myself to expression by my outer self, insistent and tyrannical as that need is. My truest self, who is below all other selves, my most intimate life and joys and sufferings, thoughts, emotions, and dreams must find expression. Yet I cannot save in this hidden way. Far more influential than Sharp himself, Fiona MacLeod was at the center of the Scottish branch of the Celtic literary revival and was called by the Irish Independent the one and only Highland novelist. MacLeod fits into the tradition of great Scottish writers as a kind of mystical Robert Burns. For example, in her poem, Eily My Fawn, MacLeod writes, O oh, far away upon the hills at the lighting of the dawn, I saw a stirring in the fern, and out there leapt a fawn. And O oh, my heart was up at that, and like the wind it blew, till its shadow hovered o'er the fawn, as mid the fern it flew. Which, to me, is reminiscent of Burns' poem from a hundred years before, my heart's in the highlands, my heart is not here, my heart's in the highlands chasing a deer. However, Burns' sentiment is direct in a stereotypically masculine way, while MacLeod obfuscates the emotional content of the verse through the use of poetic imagery. The shadow of her heart is over the fawn instead of her heart chasing the fawn. It was not until Sharp's death, when the identity of Fiona MacLeod was revealed to the public, that MacLeod's work was reassessed by critics and rejected as overly sentimental and subsequently diminished in reputation. The mystical, poetic version of the Scottish Highlands portrayed in the writings of MacLeod connected deeply with Helen Hopekirk as an expatriate Scot who pined for her home country and as a composer with a keen literary sense. MacLeod was an ideal partner for Hope Kirk's romantic compositional style and provided the verses for many of her most successful art songs. In addition, both Hope Kirk and MacLeod were facing similar gender biases, albeit on different sides of the coin, and used their considerable talent to find a way to overcome them. In a 1905 letter to Helen Hope Kirk, Sharp, as Fiona MacLeod, writes, my dear Miss Hope Kirk, I am indebted to you for your friendly letter and for the booklet of five of my poems set to music by yourself. 
It is always a pleasure to hear from anyone to whom writings of mine have strongly appealed, and that pleasure is enhanced when one learns that the unknown friend began the silent acquaintanceship years ago and has since cared to maintain it. I like your music. It has fragrance and charm. Much of it passes from the pleased suspense of the outward ear to the subtle inward ear. That which we mean when we say the mind and soul listen as well as the body. I hope you will compose more. Do you know any of the Breton airs? They have been less exploited than the now familiar Scottish and Gaelic airs. Many are singularly plaintive and sweet. The five songs referenced in this letter are the songs that will be performed today. They were published together in 1904, but were not conceived as an interconnected group, even though they have similar themes. The first song, Molina Vakri, a Celtic lullaby, was written in Edinburgh in 1903. The second, Hushing Song, was written in Boston in 1899. Eile My Fawn was also written in Boston in 1900, while Thy Dark Eyes to Mine was written during a vacation to the Atlantic Ocean in 1899, and the Bondruid, which is a Celtic word meaning sorceress or green lady, poetically referring to the embodiment of spring, the last song, was written in Grindenwald in the Swiss Alps in 1900, so quite a diverse uh, geography for these songs. Helen Hopekirk's five songs on verses of Fiona MacLeod illustrate the composer's sensitive attention to text setting and her idiomatic accompaniments often trust the most interesting musical content to the pianist. The poems are taken from MacLeod's 1896 collection, From the Hills of Dream. The manuscripts for the first and third songs were given to the Library of Congress as part of a gift of 11 manuscripts donated by Helen Hopekirk in 1918. They are individually cataloged under the call number ML96.H81 for those of you who are making the trek across the street to look at things after this is over. In 1954, Hopekirk's biographer Constance Hall donated a collection of 140 items to the library, creating the Helen Hopekirk collection. The collection includes holograph manuscripts for many unpublished instrumental and vocal works, including her two violin sonatas, her orchestral tone poems, her concert stück for piano and orchestra, and numerous songs and piano pieces, as well as scrapbooks, literary manuscripts, photographs, a small amount of correspondence, and a true oddity, an admission card for the reinterment of Beethoven on June 21st, 1888. Beethoven scholars will know that this is the second reinterment of Beethoven when he was moved to rest next to Franz Schubert in Vienna. Uh, the collection and Helen Hopekirk's published work is accessible in the Performing Arts Reading Room in the Madison Building across the street. And now, I would like you to join me in welcoming soprano Jennifer Wintel and pianist Joy Schreier for a performance of Helen Hopekirk's Five Songs on Verses of Fiona MacLeod. Thank you. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank Jennifer and Joy again for a beautiful performance of these rarely heard songs. Uh, does anyone have any questions in the time remaining about Hope Kirk or uh, how beautiful my wife's voice is or what a great player Joy is or anything like that? Everyone good? Steve. How did you get interested in this? I got interested in this the way I have gotten interested in many things over the past six years, and that is uh, by going downstairs in the, uh, in the music division uh, stacks and seeing a bunch of songs uh, in a collection of a name that I had not heard before. Uh, when I was working on the uh, Songs of America website for the library, um, I started looking at different American composers who had, who had done songs, and in fact, the, the name Helen Hopekirk uh, appeared to me first on the back of a piece of sheet music um, of songs uh, published by G. Shermer, uh, songs of, um, of uh, Sid Sidney, Samuel Barber's uncle. Anyone? What? Homer, yeah. Um, Homer, sorry. Um, yeah, so I was looking at his songs, and on the back was a listing of, uh, of various things that had been published around the same time, around 1910, and Helen Hopekirk's name was on there, Clara Kathleen Rogers, and various other uh, women composers that had sort of fallen into obscurity, and I thought, well, why not go downstairs and see what we have, and in fact, we had a collection of manuscripts from Helen Hopekirk um, that proved to be quite interesting. So that was the impetus for this whole bit here. Uh, anyone else? Bonnie. Thank you all, a beautiful performance. So, so her position at New, in New England Conservatory? Yes. Teaching piano? Yeah. Not composition? No, not composition. Did she have any um, well-known students at uh, NEC? Well-known students for piano? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I'm not aware of any. Um, it may have been so, but I, I just don't happen to know. And she continued as a um, teacher there to the end of her... Um, um, actually, no. She taught there for only three or four years, uh, but she lived in Boston and taught privately for the rest of her life. She was actually a little persnickety about the whole conservatory system. She didn't like the idea of having to teach people from a particular time to a particular time, and also had students that would... She would have classes that would be for... <laughs> um, of three or four students who she would have to teach at a time. And um, the idea was that she would manage the allotted class period to get to all of those students, and sometimes she wanted to just talk to one of them for the whole time, or, you know, she didn't like those kinds of constraints. So, and the whole idea of giving grades to people for making music and all of that was actually something that she struggled with quite a bit. And so she taught there for a few years, decided she didn't really like that system, and then was a private teacher in Boston for, for a number of years after that. Thank you. Sure. What else? Anyone else? I think this is the first lecture where I think I know everyone by name in the audience. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming. I appreciate it. <laughs> Jennifer Wintle and Joy Schreier. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.